so um, we're going to talk about uh, what metaprogramming is, um, in case you're not familiar with it at all, um, uh, why you should use metaprogramming, and how to use metaprogramming. So uh, there are a lot of interpretations of metaprogramming, and it's kind of a loose definition, but um, uh, Paolo Perota um, had a, a pretty quantifiable definition. Metaprogramming is writing code that manipulates language constructs at runtime. Um, so language constructs being uh, features of like methods, classes, modules, variables, and other uh, constructs built into Ruby. So uh, why you should know metaprogramming? Well, for one, you um, understand code others have written. So if you're working with an external library or a plugin, um, as you often will be doing in Ruby, um, if you need to modify that, that plugin or library um, or debug it, if you don't have a solid understanding of metaprogramming, you're probably not going to know what's going on and probably uh, not going to be able to modify it to suit your needs. Uh, so you can solve more difficult programming problems. Um, so just knowing metaprogramming uh, gives you a, a, just a more solid understanding of Ruby. And when you encounter a difficult problem, uh, you, you might be able to solve it in, in I guess, a more object-oriented way uh, just because you have a better grasp of the object model. Uh, so you level up as a programmer. After, once you have a good understanding of metaprogramming, you, overall you just feel like you have a better grasp of, of the code and, and you have a better grasp of the higher level of how things are working. Uh, and it's also good for debugging. Um, so just by knowing metaprogramming and being more comfortable with the inner workings of, of what's going on, uh, you'll be able to uh, reflect on uh, different objects and how they're sending messages to each other um, and uh, hopefully solve uh, little debugging issues you have. Um, but so there are a lot of, um, I guess, dodges to metaprogramming. But um, so Gregory Brown says much of the metaprogramming I see is either wrong or has an equivalent that's less confusing. Um, that said, if you are comfortable with some metaprogramming tricks, um, it's definitely possible to use metaprogramming in really simple situations, really menial, uh, I guess, tasks, and you can implement metaprogramming when it's not necessary. So um, unless you have uh, an instance where using metaprogramming is overall going to make uh, the implementation clearer and uh, make your code easier to understand, it's probably not worth it considering the, uh, I guess, how difficult it is to document metaprogramming. Uh, so and it's definitely going to be harder for someone else to just pick it up and follow it. So. Uh, I guess take heed to when you're using it. Definitely if you're writing an external library, that, that's a good reason to, but um, I mean, for just a day-to-day -day simple thing, I, I just wouldn't start opening up, uh, you know, some singleton meta class and just messing with it. Uh, so uh, on to use cases. Uh, one use case is, uh, for metaprogramming is creating dynamic methods. And probably one of the most popular uh, ways to uh, create dynamic methods is with method missing. And when I say dynamic methods, I just mean um, things like uh, that in Rails, Active Record gives you, uh, for example, um, Active Record has a dynamic find methods. So you can, on any object in, in, uh, in your database, you can say uh, find by username or find by first name. Um, and query that specific column. And it's doing that with, uh, I think Active Record is doing that with method, method missing. Um, so that's a really common. I'm not really going to talk about what you're missing. Um, Michael will talk about it a little bit. This is a quote from why uh, uh, <laughs> I never used method missing. Maybe twice in all times I didn't use it. Regretted it forcefully. Ejected the code from a moving vehicle. Shed an area tear. But actually, in that same context, he actually went on to talk about all the awesome things that people don't method missing. Um, so uh, what I'm going to talk about, and I guess what's um, less wrapped upon is defined method. Oh, and to, just to mention, the reason, the reason why method missing is uh, sort of frowned upon um, is because it's um, it's got a lot of gotchas, so it's really easy to for something to go wrong. It's slower because normally if you're doing that, you have a lot of uh, if you're doing a lot of method missing stuff, you have a lot of flow control going on and a lot of if statements checking a, a regular expression. Um, so the defined method is just a, a more solid 
uh, way to create dynamic methods. And all that does is it's a method that takes a string uh, and uh, takes a block of the code that that method will be. Um, so in so one uh, good use case uh, for uh, defined method is uh, let's say I have an e-commerce website and um, I have a lot of different kinds of products and a lot of different kinds of models um, with currency fields. And um, just for reporting purposes, at, um, at any given time, I want to be able to know what the price of something was um, when taking inflation into consideration uh, based on the time that record was created. Um, so this is a, an instance where you can create a dynamic method to, to give it to you for, for any of your uh, uh, models on your e-commerce site. So uh, for this example, um, I guess just starting off, uh, we're, we're, this isn't uh, uh, in the context of Rails. So we're opening up the active record class and uh, querying the columns. And we're looking for columns that kind of fit the definition of currency, so the decimal with the uh, scale of two. And uh, for those columns, what we're going to do is call define method and uh, pass in the name of that attribute uh, with inflation. So that'll be the name of the method. So if it's uh, yeah, product, then if, if the product is a price, then it'll be price with inflation. If it's uh, a total, then it'll be total with inflation. And then the block uh, of what we're going to run. So, um, so we have an inflation for method on the class, and that will probably hit an external API uh, to, to calculate the inflation. Uh, and that will take the, the, the current amount and the, the date uh, that we want to uh, run inflation from. So uh, in this instance, it will be the date that the record was created. Uh, but one of the things we have to do when we call inflation for is we need to invoke that attribute um, on that object. So uh, if we just put column.name, it, it wouldn't actually call that method. It would just return the string, the, the string for the column name. Um, so what we have to do is we need a way to send the message to that to that object, and um, for that you send. Um, so send takes um, an argument of the method that you want to invoke on the object, and then you can pass in any number of arguments for the method that you're calling. So back to this, we call send and then call dot name. So if the column name is total, then we're calling invoking total. Um, that getter and then passing in the created app. So then the result of that is now any any model that's in our Rails application, we can say, so we can say product at first at price and get the have the normal getter return the price. And now we can say price with inflation and get it with inflation. And so now that'll work on any currency field um, in our Rails application. Oh, and also um, if you're wondering for defined method, how would you actually uh, define a method that takes arguments? You can uh, create uh, the type variables, and so, uh, so in this case, you would take the name and the date. But uh, for this uh, particular instance, since we're just querying the database, we don't need it. Um, but that's how you would do it if you were wondering. Um, so uh, yeah. So now going back to this, um, another use case is: what if we wanted to do something similar, but do it at the class level in Ruby? One nine, it would be pretty easy. Instead of define method, you could just call define singleton method, and that would define the class method. In Ruby one eight, it's a lot harder because pretty much all you have is define method, and define method is a class method that defines an instance method. So how would you define method but get the class? Um, and for that, we have Ruby's uh, wonderful shovel operator. Um, the shovel operator is a way to get to a uh, meta class of an object, um, and so just by talking about meta classes, it's probably worth um, talking about briefly the way the uh, Ruby object model is before we move on to that. Um, so, uh, as as brief as possible, and, and there's definitely uh, there's a videos by Dave Thomas um, on um, Prag Prog, um, and they explain the object model in, in, in a lot of depth, and they were really great, so I highly recommend those. But uh, just a summary of the way the Ruby object model works. Uh, when, you, when you create any object, so in this case, a, a user, or an instance of user class, so here we have a user class, and that inherits from object, and uh, we are calling user.new, and we're storing that as a variable called user. So we have an instance of user. When you call any method on an instance, 
Uh, one thing you might think is that it calls the method on itself, but um, the, the instance doesn't actually store those methods because those methods, um, if it stored those methods, one thing you can do in Ruby is reopen a class and define new methods. And when you do that, then all instances of that class need to have that method. So if it stored its own methods, it, it wouldn't be able to, everything would be out of sync every time you, you dynamically open the class. Um, so what it actually does is it stores the methods, uh, those instance methods on the class, and it just points to those methods. So when you call it a method on, on an instance, it goes up and it tries to call, um, uh, see if that class is a method. If it does, then it invokes a method. If it's not there, then it goes up the chain again uh, up to the super class and sees if, the, if that has a method. If that doesn't have a method, then it will uh, handle a uh, method missing, which Mike will talk about uh, a little bit more. Um, and essentially, you'll end up with an undefined method error. Um, so one of the things that you can do in Ruby, though, is um, modify instances. So you could, um, for example, store the instance there we have user equals user.new, and you could actually define a method just on that instance. And only that instance will have that method. All other instances won't have that method. So in this case, uh, we're defining method age on only that instance. So just based on um, the way the object model is working, uh, if it stored it on the user class, then all instances would have that method. But we know that's not the way it works. So the way Ruby handles that is it sticks a class um, in between, uh, in the inheritance chain, in between itself and its uh, its class, uh, which uh, is often referred to as the meta class. There's a lot of names for it, but meta class seems to be the most common. Um, and so it actually creates this this meta class and puts the method on the meta class. So in this uh, instance, the meta class would just have the method age. Um, so now when you call user dot age on, and, and this meta class is unique to just this instance. So when you call user dot age now, it will look up. And it will see if age is on the meta class. In this case, it is. So it will just invoke that method. Uh, if you call a different um, a different method, then uh, again, it would look up. It would see that it's not in the meta class, but that meta class just has age. It would look up again at user and then find the method and invoke it. Um, so what about class methods? Uh, the same logic actually applies for class methods. So uh, when you define a class method, you're actually defining a method of automatic class. So if we just look at the class method as just another object, um, it works the same way. The, 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 the class for its cl doesn't actually store its class methods on itself. It stores its class methods on a meta class. So uh, all of those, all of the method, all of the def self dot methods are actually stored on a meta class. So when you call a class method like say all, uh, it's actually looking up at the meta class and then invoking the method. And uh, Ruby dynamically creates these meta classes uh, as you go. So if you try to uh, define a method on the meta class, the meta class would create a meta meta class, and et cetera, et cetera, which I think is really cool. Um, so if we wanted to call define method and actually have it define a class method, it would be great if we could have self be in the context of the meta class and then go code on the meta class. And the way you do that is um, with the shovel operator. So here we have a similar situation, but this time we're going to call define method uh, as a class method. And the way we're doing that is calling class and then the shovel operator, and then that'll take whatever object you want to pass to it. So in this case, we're just passing itself, which is the class. <coughs> and, um, I can just call a I can put active part base there and then get in the meta class that way. So this is uh, a feature of Ruby, and this is what Ruby gives you to get access to a meta class. This is pretty much the only way to gain access to a meta class. Um, so now that we're, so now we've, we've changed the context to now be in the meta class. Uh, so when we call define method here, that meta class will define a method on its instance, which happens to be the class. So it's a class method. Um, and, and now we can do something like uh, just an overall class method like average blank with inflation and, and get an average um, uh, of all of the um, of all of those fields. So uh, so now we can do product that average price and get uh, the average price, and we can do product that average price with inflation and get with inflation. Um, so given that the 
uh, the, that when you define a, a class method, you're never actually defining it on a class, you're defining it on the meta class. When, when we call dev self dot up there, we're just doing the same thing. Uh, so we can actually just move that in the context of the meta class and get the exact same result. So if you have a singleton class or a class with a lot of class methods, uh, commonly in external libraries, you'll just see <coughs> open, open up the meta class and just start defining methods that way instead of having to type self dot over and over again. And uh, with that, I guess uh, Michael will take it away with some some of the use cases and habits. And when I say pattern here, uh, what I have in mind is a solution to some, some well, maybe common or less common problems that you might encounter. Um, I, I know patterns are not typically uh, smiled upon in the Ruby community the way they are in some other programming communities, um, but pattern just seem to be the best name for what I'm going to show you. So if you want to say some metaprogramming tricks, that, you know, that'd be fine too. Um, so five of them that I'm going to discuss are uh, something called open class. I'll talk about method missing a little bit. Uh, we'll discuss um, what a blank slate is. Uh, we'll talk about something called a round alias, which is sort of like a method wrapper. And we'll also look at including and extending modules um, in a way that you're doing both around the same time. Um, I'll, I'll one disclaimer on the last one. So I had made these slides a few days ago, and then today I actually found a better way to handle this last one that doesn't use metaprogramming. Um, so I'll show you that too, because I think that um, that, that would be a better solution, uh, both because it's, well, really just because it's simpler. So let's talk about this open class pattern. So you encounter a problem where you need to modify a class. Um, maybe either redefining a method or um, probably more commonly adding methods. Um, so yeah, one thing you could do is just subclass, right? So you could create a subclass of string and then add methods to that subclass. One downside to doing that though is everywhere you want to use this new method, you need, you know, my new string dot new dot whatever your, your method is, um, which can get a little bit tedious. Um, one solution is just to reopen the class. So in some languages, uh, you, you can't do this. Um, however, in Ruby, we're not really redeclaring the class, um, we're just reopening it. So whenever you see class and then followed by a name, um, this is all executable code in Ruby. Um, and it just so happens, in the midst of this executable code, we're defining a new method. So uh, penultimate means second to last. So let's say that you've got an array, um, and just all over your app, you want to find the second to last element for some reason. Um, well, the easy way to do this is just to open up the class array, define penultimate. Um, let's say that we just return nil if there are zero or one elements in the array. Um, but if there aren't, if there are more than that, then we can just take the second to last element. So calling, um, say, like one to penultimate, we'll just give us nil, whereas uh, an array of some of the Fibonacci numbers, that penultimate would give us three. Um, here's a slight variation on that. Um, so Oppie Grimm from the Ruby Rogues uh, seems, I, I think if I got it right, he would prefer to do something like this. And I'll, I'll explain it. So what we're doing is reopening the class. So we're, we're saying we're declaring class array again. And then inside of that, we're creating a, sort of like a namespace module. So we'll say element finder. And then in this module, we go ahead and we define the same method again, the final ultimate. Um, and the method body is just the same. But as soon as we close this module, we include element finder. And um, if you don't know, if you include a module in your class, what it does is take all of the instance methods of the module and make them instance methods of the class where you include that module. So what we've done here is we've basically taken this penultimate method from this element finder module and we've tacked it on to the array class. Um, an advantage of doing this, if you're debugging, is that when you call array ancestors now, um, it lists all of the ancestors or all the things that it inherits from. Um, and you can see that array colon colon element finder is now in this um, inheritance chain. 
So uh, for what it's worth, you could use uh, the other way, or you could use this method as well. This is a little bit more complicated, but it might make debugging a little bit easier uh, if you're using ancestors in your debugging. One gotcha there, though. Yeah, let me get the gotchas. Um, so um, don't overwrite methods that already exist on the class you reopen. Um, you might think it would be a really good idea to intentionally overwrite something, but I would still recommend not doing this. Um, in part, because if you have, um, if there's any documentation out there on the classes that you're reopening, um, now you've got a situation where your documentation and your implementation are actually two different things. Um, and when you write code, um, you obviously want to write code that the machine is going to properly interpret and execute. Um, however, it is at least as important to write code that other developers are going to be able to look at and understand. Um, so the less you can do things that are confusing, I think the better off everybody's going to be. Second, um, I would recommend not unintentionally overriding an inherited method. Um, so even if you're not overriding a method, say, on the array class, there might be another class um, further up in the inheritance chain um, that has a method defined that array is inherited. But you might not necessarily know that if you're just looking at the array documentation. Uh, so be careful there. You know, you might just want to call like array.method name um, or array.u.method name um, just to see if it throws a no method error. And if it does, you're probably okay to go ahead and reopen the class and define a method. And third, I would recommend not modifying too many core library objects or core library classes. Um, if you start monkeying around a lot with the string class and a lot with the array class and a lot with some other core classes, um, your code is going to be um, more confusing. Because now you have two different places to look for you know, basically the documentation. Uh, one is the Ruby docs, and then the second is some lib file that you've got in your project. So what happens, though, if you really, uh, actually, no, I'll get back to that. So let's talk about method missing. Um, so Joseph said, this is uh, generally more frowned upon than just um, dynamically defining a method in another way. But um, sometimes uh, you might find this implementation to be the best for you. Uh, so when a method name resolution fails to find a method, Ruby invokes method missing. Um, so if you remember, there was this, this class hierarchy. You had like, your user class, and then above that, that inherited from object. In Ruby 1.9, that inherits a basic object. Um, if you call a method and it can't find it in any of those places, it's going to drop back down at the bottom of this inheritance chain and look for a method missing method. Um, and if it doesn't find it, it'll just move back up the chain. And then eventually, it'll hit the kernel module, um, which throws in a method error, because uh, it has method missing defined on it. Um, now, Active Record does something like this. So, uh, you actually talked about some of the dynamic finders. So, if you have an Active Record object in, uh, or an Active Record class, or something actually technically that inherits an Active Record base, um, and it's a model, let's say it's a, a shirt model, and you want to find, you, you call it shirt dot find all by color, or something like that, if you want to find all the blue shirts. Um, well, what Active Record does is it defines method missing. And it takes a method ID or method identifier um, that's not a number, um, your arguments, and then the option to block. And then it says if match, and then it invokes this dynamic, uh, dynamic finder match, and we'll look at that in just a second. Um, then it, it does stuff. You know, else it just calls super, um, which is going to start looking higher in the inheritance chain for another method missing uh, method. Um, so this dynamic finder match. Uh, looks at the method you're trying to call, and it uh, it converts to a string. Handle that in a certain way. So you know our our find by color would um, would this regular expression would catch that, and then it would deal with that appropriately. So things like um, ORMs are. are wonderful examples of, of where method missing um, could probably be your project some good. Um, a few things to keep in mind, though. You do want to pass args as a parameter, or, or something like this, um, because you're not necessarily going to know all the different ways that people are going to um, call methods that might not happen to exist, that you might happen to want to catch uh, and do something with. 
Um, you also want to call super at the end so that if your method missing method um, can't handle whatever somebody's trying to call, you just delegate that to another class higher in the inheritance chain. And finally, uh, it's a good idea to use respond to as well to see if your class uh, can indeed handle the method that somebody's trying to invert. However, there are some gotchas, so uh, no free lunch, as they say. Um, debugging can be exceptionally difficult. Um, a lot of times when I'm trying to debug something and I see a method that gets invoked, I, I pretty immediately jump to the method definition. So if you're using TextMate, like, you might just um, try to do, like, you know, use ACMate or search the entire project for like def, space, and then the method name. Uh, or if you're using Vim and you're using C tags, you can just do control, uh, right, square bracket, and that'll jump to the method definition. Um, if you're dynamically creating methods, um, that's not going to work. And so it can be kind of frustrating sometimes to hunt down exactly where certain methods are defined. Um, so just keep that in mind. Um, and also, a class higher up in the ancestor chain could define a method that you wanted to catch with method missing. So if you developed your own um, like database layer and somebody called like find by a shirt color or something like that, and you were intending to handle that in your method missing method, but another class that you're inheriting from for whatever reason has actually defined the find by a shirt color method, your method missing method isn't going to do anything. Because that only gets called if nothing in the inheritance chain can deal with the method that's getting called. So if that happens, um, there are a few ways to deal with that. Uh, and one of those is called blank slate. And the idea here is that you're removing all instance methods that you've inherited from other classes. So no parent defined methods intercept the message en route to your own method missing method. If you're using uh, Ruby 1.8, it's a little bit more tedious to implement this. Um, so what you're basically going to do is once you open up your class, you declare your class, um, you're instantly going to um, call instance methods. And what this does is it returns an array of instance methods that the class has. Um, and it's not just instance methods that the class itself has declared. By default, it's also methods that have been inherited from other classes. So we're going to iterate through each one. and if the stringified method name doesn't match method missing or respond to or something that begins with two underscores, we just undef it. So we're undefining all of these methods that have been inherited from other classes. In Ruby 1.9, it's actually much easier to do. We just inherit the basic object. Um, basic object really doesn't have very, method, very many methods that it itself defines. So if you inherit straight from basic object, um, you've pretty much done the same thing. Um, Rails used to, I don't think it still does, I think it does. Um, it has some sort of implementation of, of uh, blank slate. I think it's a blank slate module or a class in there somewhere. Um, I had a hard time finding it in the documentation recently, but I think it's in there somewhere. Um, but I, I honestly don't know how to use it. But if you're really interested in doing this, you might want to check that out. Another pattern that we're going to look at is called a round alias. And what this does is it lets you modify existing methods. Um, we'll look at some gotchas with this as well. Um, I just used this today. I mean, it was just temporary, but I was uh, working with a project. Um, that's, well, of course, we all probably do this when we get paid. Um, but I was working with a particular method that was in, um, in the rake library, and I, I wanted to get inside of it and know what was going on. I, I really wanted to, to read um, to read some, some state, basically. Um, and one option I, I could have done is just open up the code, right? Open up the gem code, and then modify it in place, and then just make sure I change it back when we're done. Um, but what I did is I, I temporarily um, used something called a round alias. So let's say that you get this in a library. So this is into your own code, um, which means you probably shouldn't just modify it directly. So my class, um, it's got a method called sentence size, and the intention of this is to take a string and uppercase the first letter. 
Um, now, we could just use string, like the, the capitalized method of a string. Um, however, that would have the effect of capitalizing the first letter and lowercasing everything else. So that's not really going to work well for us. Um, so my class.new.sentenceize, hi, I'm Michael, will capitalize the first letter, and um, we can almost go in our merry way. Um, it's not really a sentence. It doesn't have a period at the end. There's no punctuation. So maybe, you know, it'd be fine for an IM, but, um, but it's not really a sentence. So we'd like to modify this to add a period at the end. <coughs> so the strategy here is first to use um, either alias or alias method. I would recommend alias method. Um, they work very similarly. Um, but there were some nuances with alias that might not um, work as expected. So what we're going to do is say alias method, and we're going to give a new name to this method. So old sentence size. Um, and ignore for a moment the, the def sentence size. So if all I did was call alias method old sentence size and then sentence size, um, I could now access this method using two different values. <coughs> so either sentence size or old sentence size would, would call the same body of code. However, what I'm going to do is redefine sentence size. Now, this old sentence size method um, points to the old code. So the fact that I'm redefining this really doesn't change the implementation of old sentence size. That's still going to point to whatever code was defined here. So we've kept ourselves a reference to the old code, even though we're redefining it. So here, on my first line of sentence size, um, I'm going to call that old method and save it as a variable. And if it doesn't end with a period, I'm going to go ahead and append a period at the end of the string and then return it. So now, when I call my class that new size, Lucy met the train, the train met Lucy, the tracks were juicy, the juice was Lucy. Um, it adds a period at the very end. Um, all the uppercase is preserved. Um, and it's proper English. Sort of. Yes. So, okay. The ellipses may be not proper English, but it's good enough. Um, do you be careful if you decide to use this. Um, you can break stuff. Uh, sort of like if you monkey patch a method that third party libraries use. Um, if there's code out there that's expecting um, methods to act in a certain way and then you start changing things, um, you, you know, your changes might ripple a little bit further than you expected, and things might break. Um, and second, uh, if you use this twice in the same class, in the same way, in other words, um, you call alias method old sentence size, sentence size uh, twice, and then you call the sentence size method, um, you're going to get, I think it's like a stack level 2D error. Um, Ruby's just going to throw up his hand and say, I, I'm going to loop, and I don't know what to do, and this is going to crash. Uh, so let me talk about one more thing. Um, and then I'm going to tell you why you really probably shouldn't use um, metaprogramming to, to handle this. Um, so there is this, um, this library called Paper Trail. It's a gem. And what it does is it lets you keep track of the changes that you've made to um, your model records. So you've got uh, a table that holds a bunch of shirt information. Um, and you know, on one of your shirts, you change the color from red to green, something like that. Um, what Paper Trail would do, if you call this method in your model, is it'll keep track of that. And so it's, it's a really easy auto log. And the way it works, uh, so in, the, in one of the files, um, at the bottom of the file, it lazy loads some code on active record. So active support on load, active record. Um, what, what this is going to do is Anything that's in the block following this, and here it's going to be include paper trail model, um, is going to be executed in the context of the active record base class. But it's going to do it lazily. So it's not actually going to do anything until we, we invoke like, something on active record base. I, I think I'm understanding that correctly. Uh, if I'm not, just catch me at the end. So we're including this module, paper trail model. But let's take a look and see what that does. So paper trail, module model. First thing it does is call uh, def self.included base. Um, 
modules have a few uh, a few hooks or a few callbacks. So if you include a module and then this method is defined under module, it's going to execute some code. And here, what it does is um, base is the um, the model that we're that's including um, the uh, this module. Uh, so let's say that you had a shirt class that inherits from active River base. Um, base send extend would say um, nope, I'm not telling you that correctly. I'm sorry. Um, this is going to extend active record base um, with this class methods module, which basically tacks on a has paper trail method uh, onto the class. So it, it defines a class method basically. And then the first time you call has paper trail, I'm going to jump back. It calls send and include instance methods on this module down here. So on your model, it's going to include this module. And then you've got all sorts of instance methods that are available to you. Um, so you're not just keeping an audit log. You can query to see whether things have changed. You can do all sorts of stuff. Um, the reason that I, I brought this up was this the included callback. It's metaprogramming-ish. Um, it calls send. But I think that we could probably clean this up some. Um, Unicast has written an article saying we really need better Ruby idioms. Um, he really wants people to stop um, treating the include uh, word like extends. So people are using include to create class methods on, on classes. Um, and it would actually be much better to do this. So extend takes the methods of a module and creates them as class methods in a class. So this would really be a much better implementation. Um, rather than include paper trail model, we should just extend it. And then the paper trail model, now you can see there's no callback. It's just an instance method that has paper trail. And as soon as that gets invoked, uh, we include this instance methods module. So no metaprogramming, nothing done behind the scenes, a little easier to keep track of. So you decide. We could do this. Or if we had implemented it, implemented it a little bit differently, we could have done something like this, where when we included the paper trail model, um, we could have invoked that included callback and then tacked on some class methods. Or we could have done this and just included the module and then turned around and extended it. So I think this is a little, uh, it's a little funkier. So there are some trade-offs here. So we've talked about um, opening classes. We've talked about uh, aliasing, th aliasing things, uh, modules some. Um, in addition to some of the gotchas from earlier, I would highly recommend, if you're going to meta program, um, comment your code pretty thoroughly. Give an example of, like if you're defining a method dynamically, like give an example in, in, in your comments, like what, what the new method should look like, what it should do. Um, I know generally speaking, um, Rubyists don't seem to like commenting as much as other people in other languages do. Um, this is an instance though where I would highly recommend doing it. Um, second, carefully weigh your options before resorting to metaprogramming. Um, you know, it's possible that you think metaprogramming is the best solution where maybe you just need to learn to use modules a little bit more effectively. Um, and third, metaprogramming can be difficult to debug. Um, here are some more resources. Um, it's a whole slew of them. The last six, I think, are blog posts. The first two are books. Um, there's a fragmented programmer book called Metaprogramming Ruby. Um, it's really good. It's a lot of examples. Um, it's a bit verbose, maybe annoyingly so. I, I think the second book by David Flanagan and uh, Max, um, called, I think, the uh, Ruby Programming Language, says just about all the same things in like 50 pages instead of 200 some. Uh, but it doesn't have as many examples. So, but I would recommend both. Um, so let's uh, let's have some Q and A for maybe uh, five or ten minutes, um, and as we're uh, passing out um, the note cards, if you would, if anybody would like to give us feedback, um, go ahead and jot some things down. Um, so, are there any questions or comments on uh, any of the meta programming things that we talked about? Yeah, could you speak a little bit to caching methods that are conflict methods? Say that again? Uh, could you speak a little bit uh, as to caching methods that are called method missing? Caching methods that, that are called method missing? Yeah. No. 
I actually can't. I, I, I really don't know anything about it, and so I don't feel qualified to. I mean, I can make something up, but it really wouldn't help anybody. Uh, do you know anything about it? Well, it, it was just um, more of if you do catch a method with method missing, yeah. it's something that's called up, and you can just go ahead and define that method so that it doesn't have to go all the way up the chain. They can just hit it immediately the next time it's called. It's, okay. it's really fast. You can use define method, I think, to do that. That's what Hack Record yeah. does or used to do. Yeah. Um, it would define a whole bunch of methods with method missing. If you called it, it would actually use define method to insert that method on your model. So that the next time you use that method, it would actually hit. Makes sense. And so not trick method missing all the way up the various chain. Cool. So just for the recording, um, the suggestion was to call define method within the context of a method missing method, um, so that uh, next time somebody invokes a method, um, it doesn't hit method missing. It just uh, it just calls a method on the, the class itself. Yeah. Uh, could you show your final slide? Sure. This one? Uh, yes. Uh, yes. So I feel like uh, it was it was fostered over quickly, and I have a vague idea of what it does, but I would uh, like a little bit more discussion about what exactly the sent does. Because uh, we talked about her, like, uh, and, like what object it sends a message to. Yeah. Um, so let's see, I'm going to jump back to where it's used. Um, yes, I'm sorry. Um, so the question was, can we talk a little bit more about the send method and what the send method does? Um, I'm going to jump out of um, the, let's see, let me get this lovely screen recording here. Um, so if you have, uh, oh, I don't know, so class, uh, my class, um, def, say, I, and then. Um, the way you use this, uh, so <coughs> you wrote that you don't ever execute code in presentations, so um, if this blows up, then I'll just swing it and do something different. But um, my class at new, uh, we can do my class at new dot say, right? And it would say hi. Um, um, so these would be equivalent. Um, what we're doing is we have an object, in this case my class.new. I, I guess it might be clearer if I said, um, oh, I don't know, speaker. This one right? Yes, okay. So what we're doing is um, we're, we're, we're basically sending a message to an object. I mean, that's terminology that's um, Objective-C-ish, I guess. But, um, so we're, we're taking this same method and we're invoking it on the speaker object. Um, and you can pass an argument as well doing this. Um, this is particularly useful if you want to invoke methods that are, um, are private. Like, there's really no reason to use send if you're just calling public methods. Um, but you can use uh, send to uh, invoke private methods. Um, you can use send to invoke methods where um, if you like are dynamically sort of generating this method name that you want to call. Um, so I mean, you could do like, I don't know, this is going to be a bad example, but speaker, there's so speaker dot public methods. And I'm going to say, uh, let's say, uh, boy, this is bad. Um, Oh, I don't know. Well, for some reason, if, if you know there were like ten methods, you know, like say, um, say hi, say hi, say cry, you know, an array, and then call send um, using each of those. Did I explain that clearly enough? Or I think so. Yeah. Okay. Because I haven't shaved it. Um, so did that help? I mean, was that sufficient? Yeah. So, um, so my uh, my my confusion around this is uh, is uh, context from generally called within. Uh, you're going to call it in the class um, definition. So, uh, send sends to the instance of uh, the class, right? Um, if, if you call send without any um, without any any object kind of attached to it. So let me go back here for a sec. Yeah. Yeah. 
lets you do two things. It lets you override the receiver of the method, which is helpful for calling protected or private methods, where you shouldn't be. And it allows you to pass the name of the method in a way that makes it easy to dynamically change the name of the method. So it gives you those two things kind of in one package. Um, like here, the, the context for send, like if you don't have like, I don't know, my class out send or you know, occupy send, it, it's just going to assume it's self. So this is equivalent to saying down here, self.send. Okay. Um, and when this gets included, that self is going to point to or refer to the class um, that the module is included on. So did, between us, did we kind yes. of Okay. Yeah. And that's, probably him more than me. That's not special to send. I mean, send is just a message itself, right? So just like any other one, if you don't have an explicit receiver, it gets sent to self, right? If you have an explicit receiver, that's the object that's going to be sent. Any other questions? It's called master metaprogramming. There were several things that we didn't cover. I mean, metaprogramming is um, complex enough and broad enough that I mean, you could take you know you could take a few days to just talk about it and learn about it. Um, so we were very selective. We thought it would be better just to choose a few things, talk about them hopefully thoroughly enough that you could actually use them, um, rather than just mention everything that there is to mention, um, and then have everybody walk out and say, well, that was nice, but I can't really use anything. So Michael, yes. go back to the slide that had, where I tried to interrupt you, it was the, uh, the gotchas. <laughs> the one right before the gotchas. Uh, Didn't that? Yeah. Uh, the next one, I think, was it? Yeah. So, you're right. I mean, you don't want override or overwrite methods. The gotcha on this one, though, is that this one, if, if the if array already had a method called penultimate, this one would never get called. Because sure. it's, because you're including it as a module, it's actually after the class itself. Yeah. Yeah. So in um, yes, actually, I was, I was going to explain that you can understand that. So yeah. Agreed. Um, so his comment was just for the video. Um, if the array class already had a penultimate method defined on it, um, doing this code in this slide really wouldn't do anything because in the inheritance chain, the module gets inserted above the array. So when you call um, like array.new.penultimate, actually that would just return no because there are no elements in the array. But, um, but this method wouldn't get invoked. The penultimate uh, method defined in the class, the array class, would get invoked instead.